Hi, everybody, and thank you for joining me on this week's Tell Us How to Make It Better podcast. One of the most important decisions that homeowners make is either who is building your house or who is remodeling it. Choose the wrong person or company, and it can turn your life upside down. There was a story on the local news here today of a woman who bought a D.R. Horton home, and watching the video made me sick what a buyer is going through and how awful the work appears to be. So how do you separate the good people from the bad when it comes to making this decision? It's no secret, I'm not a fan of the home building industry, but I know there are great builders and contractors out there, and I love learning how you do your job right so the buyer gets what they're paying for. That's what we're talking about on today's podcast. You'll meet Jay Jenkins, a residential contractor in Tampa, Florida, who tells us we can have a great building experience and not a nightmare. I'm George Siegel, and this is the Tell Us How to Make It Better podcast. Your home is probably your biggest investment, and every week we show you warning signs and solutions to help you protect it. Tell Us How to Make It Better is partnering with The Readiness Lab, the home for podcasts, webinars, and training in the field of emergency and disaster services. Jay, thanks for joining me today. Thanks, George. Appreciate you having me. Now, it's kind of funny how we're ending up doing this. Uh, Full disclosure, Jay and I play pickleball uh, on weekends, and I was mouthing off last week about horrible building experiences I've had, and this guy's steaming over there. He's looking at me like, who is this asshole? What's he saying? And... uh, (laughs) So I, I was just saying how I've never had a good building experience. And I said, you're a builder, aren't you? And <laughs> you agree? You told That's me, true. Yeah. Yeah. And here we are today. So what were you thinking when I was saying that as somebody who was hearing your profession denigrated by some smart ass? You know, unfortunately, I think a lot of people have that type of experience. So when you look at building, I think a lot of people don't do due diligence. They need to slow down, spend time with their contractor really understand the scope of work and have a well-defined statement of work so that the project can be successful, both for the builder as well as for the client. Now, is there a difference in dealing with somebody who's having a house built from scratch, a custom home, versus a remodel like the house we're in now? I think it should be the same process. Because... In a remodel, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of surprises along the way. There should be less of those if you're starting from from scratch. Obviously, yeah. So when you're doing a remodel and you say to a client, okay, it's going to be this much money, this is what we're going to do, are there contingencies built in as you rip open that wall and you realize, "Ah, I can't just do this, I have to do these five other things? Yeah, I mean, in the project we're in right now that we're sitting in today, um, we had a few of those. Um, and we basically up front talk with the clients about where those pitfalls could be. And so, you know, we had some of them here, and you'll get to talk with with the clients here in a few minutes, and they'll kind of share with you their experience. But we did have um, two or three areas where we said, hey, this could happen. We don't know what we don't know until we open things up. And we did find, uh, both in the air conditioning, we had to rebuild that where we thought we could utilize it. Um, So we completely revamped it re-energy calced it and gave them a really good efficient uh, AC cooling system. Um, They were having trouble with the toilet not draining properly. We looked at it initially and said, oh, well, it's not vented with a vent. Uh, That sewer line needs to have a vent on it so the water can flow naturally. We figured that was the problem. Once we put in the new sewer lines, connected it to the old sewer line, took it to the street, it still wasn't draining. And when we went outside and started digging, we discovered that the sewer line ran through the root field of a tree that was right next to the house, raising the sewer line. And that's what was keeping the the debris from flowing freely from the uh, the line. So those are the kinds of things. And that was one that they didn't know about and that we didn't anticipate uh, at the time either. So the surprises are going to be a lot different when you're doing a remodel than they should be on new construction. Yeah. Somebody comes to you for building a brand new house. Um, I had a guest on recently that teaches an entire course to follow every step of the construction process because there are so many it's it's overwhelming everything you have to pick out everything you have to to do along the way how do you help people through that process or is it kind of you you can handle it and they don't even have to worry about it you know i mean fit and finish is one thing um, design of the home, obviously, is, is a collaborative effort, right? Where do you want the walls? Where do you want the bathrooms? Thinking about things about, you know, hey, this door opens up, but it opens halfway into the opposing door. Making sure that you avoid those kinds of things. Um, fit and finish stuff is really up to the client, but we'll work with them, as we did in this project. Um, we were trying to come up with a unique baseboard and door trim design. Couldn't find anything that we liked, um, 
you know, at our normal sources. So we started going online and finding things and the client actually said, hey, I really like this. So we custom built that. So, you know, where, where we have to come in and, and provide that kind of, you know, guidance we do. I mean, does that kind of answer what you were looking for, yeah, you think? Or? Yeah, sure. I think that'll work. Uh, but in terms of communication, so is there a project manager that the client deals with? Is a small company? Do they deal with you directly on these things? Deal with me directly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we talk every day. We have, I would say, we have daily progress reports. So, hey, we got this done. This is where we're at today. This is what the balance of the week looks like. We've got these inspections coming. So I try to be very collaborative and engaging with the client so they know what the process is. And that, um, hey, we won't be here tomorrow because we need to wait for this to come in or we're waiting for something. Um, instead of just not showing up or kind of turning into a ghost for three or four days, which a lot of builders do. How much do you like or dislike having the buyer or the person who you're building the house for to be there on the job site and to be watching what's <laughs> going on? Because I, I had a builder yeah. who actually came out and was yelling at me saying he was mad at me for being there all the time. He goes, I don't need another foreman out here on my job site. And I said, well, I, I'm kind of the only foreman you have out here because I'm catching all your stuff. No, I mean, you're spot on. I think the value of having the person like you in that environment is that if I miss something and you catch it or you see something that we originally thought we liked and now we want to change it, now's the time to fix it. Not after it's done and we're going through punch out and I'm like, oh God, I really don't like the way that is. So we found even in this project some things where we were going along. We thought we had some really good ideas. As we were going along, we're like, oh, but wait a minute, that's not going to work. We were putting up some cabinetry in the wine room, but they wanted crown molding. So with the cabinets that we had, we had to make some adjustments and move them over so the crown molding could, could terminate into the side of the cabinet nicely and give a nice integrated look. On a remodel, is that a change order? That was uh, not a change order. No, we just did the extra work. Um, for, for this, you know, the big stuff, ticket items, change orders. Little things like, hey, we've got to move a cabinet over or cut a, you know, maybe cut a, a filler plate a little bit wider. Nah, it's simple stuff. Yeah, the kind of stuff I was catching this guy doing is putting windows that were too small. Um, there were up, upper windows that were going to yep. be the light source for the room. He put tiny little windows in there, so we had to go back to the contract and look at the size. He put all hollow doors in when he was supposed to put solid doors in. His tile was bumpy. It was like a cobblestone road. I mean, it's like I'm a finder of bad work. I just, um, if, if yeah. you want a, a yeah. bad contractor, have me act like I'm hiring them and you will find somebody <laughs> else to use. So I'm wondering, how do people not get in that situation? It's so frustrating. It's interesting to me that you would get that far down the road and realize that they're putting in the wrong windows. Because I basically go through the plans, and I'll, I'll just use the example of when I build a spec home. I go through the plans. I understand everything in the, in the, in the environment. Um, I've worked with my architect to design the house. Once I've got that baked, I order those windows and it's done. So technically in that environment or in that situation that you had, that should have been a sign-off thing. Hey, George, here's where we are. Here's the windows we're using. This is all complete. I don't know how somebody could change something like that after you've already designated it on an engineered plan. Yeah, and another area I've always had problems with, and I know a lot of people have the same issue, is when there's that engineering plan for the air conditioning. Mm -hmm. And it's not mm -hmm. until you get in the house and you're living there that you find out, hey, this room is four degrees warmer than that other room. There's no, and then we find out when you bring in somebody to troubleshoot it, they didn't put enough return airs in. They mm -hmm. didn't put the right size tonnage in the AC system. I mean, those things just make me want to pull my hair out because I should, you, you want to think that they're doing it. When you, when you get exposed for things you're not doing, then it makes me think, well, what else aren't they doing? I mean, and, and rightfully so. I mean, it does throw a bit of caution. You know, you're like, hmm, what else is hiding behind these walls? Um, specifically, like the, the, the energy calculation, which is, is the document that we use to size and determine where vents need to go, how many need to go, the size of them. And that's all based on wall thickness, window types, whether they're, you know, low E. Um, it really is determined by the, by the building materials, frame walls versus concrete block walls. And that also drives our insulation and stuff like that. So that eliminates hot spots, cool spots. Now, we can always come back later and balance things. So we can push more air to different areas if we need to, if we find out something that the energy calc didn't tell us. But for the most part, by the time you get that house, it should be 95% baked. You shouldn't have to have, I'd say 99% baked. You shouldn't have a problem. Yeah, I've, I've had that constantly. <laughs> I, I've had that problem. And the other problem is a lot of times when you're hiring a builder or a contractor mm -hmm. as the person who, who's hired them, you don't know who their subs are. 
And yep. as a result, if they're trying to save money along the job, maybe they bring in the lowest bid guy to do the driveway. I know several builders that have done that. Maybe they bring in the lowest bid guy to do the, the uh, electrical because they can save a few dollars there. Yep. How do you avoid that? Because those kind of things, I've had subs come in or people come in to fix it yep. and they go, yeah, I wouldn't use that company. Those guys are terrible. <sighs> You know, and I tell, I tell people this, and I, I, I told um, the clients in this project, I said, you can always find a cheaper price. I guarantee you there's a guy out there that will do it for less. To me, what I do is I've kind of vetted through my team of guys, and I use them regularly and religiously. They're not the cheapest guys in town, um, but my experience with them has been fantastic. And then, of course, after, the, you know, after we turn the, the project over to the client, if there's ever anything that needs to be done, they'll come back and help service them as well. So I'm just fortunate enough that I pick people to work with that think like I do. So they carry that, that you know, the demand for quality, they carry the demand for customer service and client satisfaction. And that's, that's what's made it good for me. I pay my guys the day they get the work done. You know, I don't string people out. Um, a, lot of, a lot of builders will drag people out. And yeah. then you start, that's where you find that they can't hire the good guys. And then you get the B and C rate guys that come in to do the work. So do your homework and find out, you know, dig into your builder's history. Look at their, you know, do a background check on them. Check the Better Business Bureau. There's lots of ways for a, a client to look and find these holes and these gaps in, um, you know, in a builder. Yeah, don't always read the five-star Google reviews. I right. like to read the ones that are one and two stars. Now, that could have just been a rogue uh, yep. asshole that didn't like them, yep. but they might have some valuable information. I know the folks here talked to someone that I had built a house for, and they had given me a recommendation. I had pre-sold that house in framing stage, or no, I, actually before we even broke ground on it, I pre-sold that house, and I was with them every step of the way. So they had the benefit of hearing what that experience was like, what was like for them with me, and so, you know, the client here thought, then I can live with that. And that's, you know, that's kind of how they did it. So you got you to slow down. The biggest thing is slow down, take your time. There's no rush. Find the right person. Again, don't look for the lowest price. Don't look for the lowest bid. If you do that, that comes with consequences. I think people are afraid to do that in, in an area, especially here like South Tampa, because it's so competitive. You yep. put a house on the market, there might be five people that want it. So yep. you're afraid if I go in and ask for too much stuff, I mean, I've heard of people that are buying houses with no inspection contingency because they're so desperate to get that house. Yep. So how do you maintain your chances of success in an, a market that has a sense of urgency? Uh, yeah. Those I are mean, two kind of counter and Yeah, you're, it's kind of, it's because it's almost, a, it's a totally, it's a kind of a different thing. I mean, the challenges down here, and you look at, you said South Tampa as an example. I mean, I live here. We got fortunate. We bought just before the hike. And so we literally were, it was starting to, starting to turn and we bought down here. We lived out in West Chase um, and we bought down here. So we made an offer. It was solid. We gave them good references. We gave them good financials. The buyer felt comfortable with us and we were able to, to close that deal and buy the house. I know some people just want to live on West Corona Street. They want to live on Vasconia. You know, they want to live on Clark. And if you do that, then yes, in a lot of scenarios, you will have to step away from the inspections and things like that and know there's things you're going to have to fix. We took a lot of pictures on the street during the coronavirus to, to send to people because it was such an interesting name. Now, another thing around here, there's so many older homes yep. that are getting torn down and yep. new houses go up. The one across the street, as an example, we yeah. just, you pulled up and there's a, a dozer over there tearing a house down. Yeah, you see that all the time. Yep. And so... You know, it, but it's just so competitive to get one of those. And, to, and it, it seems like the older homes, a lot of people now are pricing them and you don't know, are they trying to get somebody that's going to live in it or are they going to tear it down and build it? I mean, you have to know the price point of what you're getting into, don't you? Well, you have to know, um, you know, we're, we were talking earlier about this and, you know, you know kind of what it's going to cost to buy a lot down here. And I mean, it used to be $250,000, right? I mean, three years ago, I could have bought a lot down here for two fifty. dollars now you're, you're going to pay six to seven hundred thousand for that same lot. Now the prices have gone from nine hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars for that same house to one point six to one point seven million. So all, all you know, tide rises all boats, right? Everything goes at the same time. But really down here, it's difficult because the builders do a lot of work far in advance of when the house goes on the market. 
they have people on their teams that are actually making phone calls, calling the owners, sending them letters. Hey, we'd love to buy your home. You know, I know you want to stay in it. We'll buy it now. You know, there's lots of buyer builders that are doing that down here. Well, they'll buy property. People still in it, um, and they know those people are going to move out or they're going to leave uh, ahead of time, and that kind of crushes that competition wave. Um, yeah, there's a house around this, uh, this the corner from us. They're trying to rent it out for fourteen thousand dollars a month. It was a house that went in foreclosure. I think they paid wow. 2.5 or $3 million for it. And they're asking 14 grand. It's a big number. Yeah, it is. I mean, it really depends on the house. It may be a spectacular house. You know, maybe Derek Jeter's house would have gone for that. I mean, that's probably a lot more than that. But that just seems, it, yeah. it's really competitive right now. It is. It's, it's slowed down a little during the summer. Though. It has a little bit, but summer always is slow, just because kids are out of school and no one's looking to move. Um, it'll start to pick up again here a little bit. This area has not seen the same impacts that you see in North Tampa and out in West Tampa. Um, here, it's, it's much different. This is a place that people look and, and fish and, and, uh, and constantly are targeting because they want to be in the area. They want to go to the Plant High School. They want their kids in Coleman. They want to be you know, in this area. Restaurants, convenience, that kind of stuff. The homeowners of the house where I interviewed Jay are Kelly and Trey McQueen. And they shared with us what they were looking for when they were choosing a contractor. So our first contractor experience, we did this kitchen when we first moved in and we didn't know the area because we had just moved here. So I interviewed a bunch of different companies and picked the one that I felt most comfortable working with. But you don't know what you don't know. And it was kind of our first really big project with remodeling. And so I just kind of took the company at their word and followed whatever they said and wasn't necessarily proactive or savvy enough to know to ask questions per se on certain things. So when the contractor, the contractor was hardly ever on site. Um, they initially quoted us three months for the project and it ended up taking about seven. And I could probably count on two hands the number of times the contractor was on site. Uh, at the end of the day, we were kind of acting as the foreman, as you kind of stated earlier for your project, where I would come in and nitpick all the details that I feel like were the things the contractor should have been picking up on. Um, and kind of felt like I was running the project rather than him. And so that was just really frustrating. And then communication wasn't good. We never knew when people were coming by, when, how long, um, you know, uh, if people were coming that day or a week or why there was a delay on work. It's just they showed up when they wanted to show up and we never heard from them ever. Did you check references before you hired them? We did. So yes and no. I didn't speak to any other customers, but uh, they had a storefront. They weren't a small company. They were a big company that are, are here in Florida. And you know, reading reviews just online, like most customers seemed pretty happy, um, which is one of the things Trey has gotten on me about that I have not posted a review online because I would not have a five star review for them. Um, and he you feels like I should warn warn people right about our experience. But um, yeah, that was kind of frustrating. And their design team, you enjoyed their design team. I love their design they team. They were very it good. Great. It was just going from the planning to execution was where there was the big gap. Mm -hmm. And uh, and actually, uh, subsequent to that, that GC was no longer working for that company. So uh, you know, there there may have been more than just one thing at work there. Um, mm -hmm. However, we don't know what it was, and as the customer, that's not on us that's on you know their fault that they weren't able to produce. We're the customer, right? So we are the ones that's supposed to be receiving the service. This whole COVID crisis and you know high demand for contractors has really turned the whole thing on its head. You know, a bid used to mean that the person that was providing the service is bidding for your services, is bidding for the opportunity for them to serve you, for you to pay them. So we had two, uh, almost three competing contractors on this service. One of, the, uh, one of the contractors, they would give us this initial very, you know, broad generalization, you know, kind of like look at the quote area. But then if we wanted to have a more detailed quote, we had to pay for it. We had to pay for them, to pr for us to then pay them more later for them to provide a service to us, okay? We had Jay, who came in, and th this could be a good or a bad, you know, depending on your, you know, I'm not in Jay's case, obviously, but depending on who you're going after, Jay was hungry. And I don't mean hungry like he needs it, but he was, he made us feel like 
we were going to be important. So the minute he came out for the bid, he brought, he came over, we did the initial walkthrough. Hey, do you want to do, do you really want to pursue this? And we said, yeah, we would like to find more details. Man, I don't know, it was maybe a week, maybe two weeks. It was a Close very short that. time period <laughs> yeah. where he had, so when you talk about his subs, we actually met most of Jay's subs mm -hmm. on day, day one that he came through and got the information that he needed to give us a more complete bid. So he had his guys come through here, walk through here top to bottom. We talked in uh, broad and more detailed brushstrokes about the project. We got to meet, you know, what I assume became most of the subcontractors that we used on the product so we could, uh, on the project, so we could see how they were, they were gonna be. And we saw that, hey, all these people, they wanted our business because they were over here because they wanted to work on this project and they wanted our money. Not they were coming over here out of the graciousness of their time because we were paying them. They wanted to work. And so that was the first step. And then, man, we got that first initial bid that we were able to start compare, uh, you know, back and forth just right away. I mean, it was so you could tell that this was going to be, you know, Jen Grow's project. You know, they, they wanted our business. And to me, that that's a big, you know, move in the right direction. Like that that started to already shift me like weighing towards towards Jay and his his company and his people because they wanted to work here and they wanted our business. And so if you want it on the, the front side, you know, that's a good lead in that you're going to be interested to get the to, to complete and follow through on the project on the backside. It might not always work out that way, but that at least steered us in the right direction because we did not have that same sense of urgency from one of the other companies. Uh, although they had a very nice product, it just wasn't, you know, the same sense. Uh, so I got the feeling that we might just be another customer to them rather than with Jay. I mean, we've really felt like he's become part of our family. I'll, I'll just give an example here. I don't want to go off too much on this, but we have a dog that doesn't like anybody that's not in the family. It goes nuts. Well, the first, I would say like couple weeks that Jay came over here, that dog had its hackles up every day, just like everybody else. Jay wasn't, Jay wasn't special in that he was, you know, getting barked at all the time. But by week three or whatever, because Jay was here so often, now the dog runs over to him because that's his new, that's her new best friend every time Jay comes in the door, you know? So that just goes to show, you know, that, that Jay just didn't take on the project, but he owned the project just like he was one of the, uh, just like he was the owner. And we could tell that as we were going through the project, you know, and I, I noticed this in the initials, you know, just little tiny details, the kind of things that, you know, Kelly's very good at finding, Jay would be finding those same things too, you know, before she caught them. Now everybody's got different eyes and that's why it's good to have uh, multiple eyes on the project. Um, but that just showed he wasn't just looking at it as like, this is a job that I have to do. He looked at it as this is a project. Uh, this is my project. I'm taking ownership of this project and I want to do the best for my clients. And when you get a relationship like that, if you find that, you know, that that's what you're looking for. Now, you know, we, did we get lucky? Yes. But there are also some hints along the way uh, that helped lead us to having good luck. All right. If you had to leave people with a tip, the number one thing, if somebody looking to remodel or build, what's the number one thing they should be thinking about when they enter into a project like that? Is there something that they should say, this is how I'm going to handle it. This is the way I should be thinking about it. I think you should have your, pro uh, your project very well defined. So slow down, take the time and think about what it is you really want the outcome to be. There's no rush. Um, talk to people. Do your research. I mean, the internet gives you more tools than we've ever had before. So for the most part, what um, I think a good solid statement of work um, in this project, they had an architect who defined a lot of these things very well. And I think the outcome for this project has been very successful. I really think that having that statement of work, that understanding what the project really is, I think I outlined something um, you know, in our notes earlier. Um, I think that's the key. And then sit down with the contract and, and spend time with these guys and listen to them. Uh, you still ticked off about me mouthing off during uh during Well, <laughs> I mean, we'll get over that probably by the end of the summer. Okay. <laughs> so. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, George. I appreciate it. It gives me hope when I hear good stories. The main theme in deciding who to hire to do your work is to research them thoroughly. 
There are no guarantees of perfection, but it sure increases your chances of the project being successful and not turning into a nightmare. If you have a building or remodeling story, good or bad, I'd love to hear about it. There's a link to a contact form in the show notes. Fill it out. and You might be a guest on an upcoming episode. Thanks for listening today. See you next time.